Okay, so uh, how does this apply to things like earthquakes? Um, how many of you felt the earthquake, what was it, on the weekend? There was a little one? <laughs> Missed it? Did you? Yeah? Okay, it was kind of, it was pretty small, but we, we felt it. This is the San Andreas Fault. And that's, it's an example of a strike-slip fault. That's where two plates are sliding past each other. And uh, the graph here shows the normal stress. So the two plates are pressed against each other. That's the normal force. And because of the currents in the, uh, inside the molten part of the Earth pushing the plates to move with respect to one another, they're trying to shear. So the shear would be the motion of one plate sliding against the other. So it's just like the friction that we've been talking about. This line shows for a whole bunch, I mean, you can't read this, but a whole bunch of different kinds of rock, what the uh, maximum shear stress that is, what's stress? It's force per unit area. So force per unit area of the surface of, or the interface between the, the two slabs of crust versus the normal stress at the time when an earthquake causes sliding. So that's the reflection of the maximum static friction that the rocks can support. And you can see there's a pretty, what, what, what is the meaning of that roughly straight line? What does that imply? Well, the fact that it's a line, what does that imply? Yeah. More, that it's a straight line or that it's increasing? Right? He says that more normal force leads to more friction. That's true, but that's, that, that doesn't rely on it being a line, that relies on it being an increasing function. Yeah? Okay, there's a linear relationship. Be, okay, but remember, this is not... Didn't we just see that for different surfaces, you could have a different angle at which it's just going to start to slip, and therefore a different angle implying a different coefficient of static friction. Yeah? So the fact that that's about a straight line implies what? Despite all these different rocks in different places, about the same coefficient of static friction for all these different interfaces between long faults. Agreed? So it's about the same use of static all over the place. So we get earthquakes here, and the earthquakes push up the mountains that are right behind us, and um, eventually will allow us to watch the 49ers um, <laughs> locally, as opposed to having to fly or take the Hyperloop or the plane up to San Francisco. Um, a few years ago, you may recall, there was a tremendous earthquake in Japan, um, which led to a disaster at the Fukushima Daiichi uh, nuclear power plant, um, and off the coast of Japan is a different situation because the fault is a subduction fault. So that means that a part of the ocean crust is being pushed beneath the plate on which Japan rides. And the difference between a subduction fault and a strike-slip fault is in the area of the contact between the two plates. Because of the shallow angle of this interface, 
the distance over which you can have rock sliding or trying to slide against rock is much greater than in a strike-slip fall where you're going to be limited by what? How far down do you care? Well, as long as you've got crust. So it will depend on the thickness of the crust. But now, if you imagine it sliding underneath at a shallow angle, the area of contact can be much greater. So for uh, the San Andreas, we might have something like 30 kilometers of vertical depth over which we can have rock pressing against rock. Whereas here, the estimated area of the sliding was more like 200 kilometers. So since there's more area, and since the coefficient of static friction is about the same, more area means that you can build up more force and store more elastic energy before things slip and it goes. And when it slips, this bumps up and launches a wave. And so the picture over here you're seeing is the elevation of the tsunami as it was propagating out uh, through the Pacific Basin. So let's get this going. So this is a NOAA video that shows you the progress of the wave as it fans out from the source. So the crust all of a sudden moves up six to eight meters. That pushes the water up all of a sudden. Now you have a pile of water, so it moves out. And some of it moved towards the coast, inundating the coast, and some of it moved in the opposite direction and headed out over the entire Pacific Basin. Uh, that's a great question. Um, the question, thank you. The question was, what is the time scale for this? Yeah, so the time actually is being shown up here. That's now two hours. Six hours. I don't know if you can read it, seven, and so on. But you see some pretty interesting behavior, obviously wave motion, as it goes out. And we will get to a study of wave motion towards the end of the course. But there's lots of interesting diffraction and interference effects that produce the ripple pattern as it goes out. 19 hours, 20 hours, okay?